conservative Christians do use an iPad for their messages. My uncle does it. But my printer is not working, and the church printer is not working at this time, so I'm going to be looking at my phone for my message tonight, all right? So don't judge me too harshly. And uh, I got this. It's very nice when you're traveling to have all your messages on, uh, on a device. And usually you can print them off, but apparently not today. All right, let me get over to my message right here. So we're going to go to uh, Exodus 17, Exodus 17. And we're going to go to verse 8. Talk about a friend tonight. A friend. Exodus 17, verse 8. If you're, if you're there with me, say amen. amen. Verse 8. Then came Elimelech and uh, Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon and Aaron and Hur stayed up upon his hands or stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And let's pray. Lord, we love you. We're thankful for you, God. I thank you for uh, Aaron and her, Lord, and how they kept up the hands of the man of God. And how at a time of great danger to the people of God, they were there to uh, help save the people of God and keep their leader and his hands up, Lord. I pray, God, now that we will just uh, be a family, Lord, that supports one another. And uh, God, a spiritual family, and Lord, that we'll be friends one to another, Lord, to be counted on, relied upon, Lord. And we love you, thank you for you, God. I pray you just give us a great rest of the night. Bless the message now in Jesus' name, Amen. So I don't know if anybody hold, held up, worked on something above your head. How many have worked on something above your head, or you just had to like use a bolt? Or I don't know how to. Does it get painful after a while? How many have done it on a car? Probably Isaac's underneath a vehicle, and you're trying to hold up something heavy or something like that. That will that will get you sore real fast. And can you imagine right here the amount of pressure that was on Moses at this time? Amalek had been an enemy of Israel from the start. They had been fighting with Israel. And here they're, out, they're in a total war. And uh, if the army of Israel is defeated, the children of Israel cease to exist. And Moses is up there, and his arms are getting tired, and Aaron and Hur lift up his arms. And I'm just talking about a friend tonight. Has it, uh, had it not been for some friends, Moses would have dropped the staff, and Amalek would have won the day. A friend can make or break us as Christians. It broke Samson with Delilah. It split the kingdom with Rehoboam and caused Amnon uh, to be gutted due to listening to a friend. You think about this right here. Friends can really make and break us. The question to ask ourselves is this. Who are my friends? Who are my friends? And someone once said, show me who your friends are and it will tell me who you are. And let's look at this right here. The right kind of friend, number one, loves you. The right friend loves you. Go to Proverbs 7, 17, 17. The right kind of friend loves you. Proverbs 17, 17. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend, what church? Loveth at all times. A friend, what church? Loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loveth at all times. You know how you know you have a good friend? is someone that loves you in the good times and the bad times. And I'm not talking about Job's kind of friends that came and just belittled him and tore him down and said, you're not right with God. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, not those kind of friends, amen. I'm talking about a friend that loves you in the bad times, the good times, the great times, the horrible times. And we all need friends that love us at all times. I'm thankful that at Moses' greatest need, at time of his greatest need, that he had a, bro uh, a brother and a friend that held up his arms, and they won the day because of it. 
I think of David's mighty men mentioned in the Bible. Go to 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. 2 Samuel. We could all use men, or friends, I should say, like David's mighty men. 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, and the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The name was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was uh, Eliezer, the son of Dodo. <laughs> the, uh, oh, you got to love their Bible names, amen. The uh, uh, Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave under the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. And if you keep reading, you'll, and I'm not going to go over this uh, all, all together, but if you keep reading, you just see all these mighty men that David had. And these mighty men, well, let's get, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 15, chapter, uh, verse 15 of chapter 23. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. So David is being attacked by his enemy, the Philistines, which were his uh, uh, lifetime enemies. And the Philistines had managed to get between David and his hometown of Bethlehem during a, a fight. And David just longed for a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. And what did those three mighty men do that it was described earlier on? They broke through an entire host of Philistines and got him a cup of water. That's a pretty good friend right there, isn't it? Pretty good friend right there. And David had these friends not only during his time of king, as king, but he also had these friends while he was running for his life from the king Saul as well. Remember that? These mighty men followed him all over the place. They followed him when a Ziglag was destroyed and their families were taken captive by, guess who? The Amalekites. And so David had these friends that followed him everywhere, that were there with him during the good times and the bad times. What is the right kind of friend? A right friend loves you. A right friend uh, loves you. They loved, they, uh, they loved David when he fled for his life, became king, attacked by his son, attacked by the Philistines, depressed, made choice, poor choices, became old. His mighty men were always there. The right friend will be there in the good and the bad times. I think of Jonathan and David as well. Remember the story of Jonathan and David. Jonathan was the king, uh, king's son, King Saul's son. And think about this right here. Saul knew that David was going to take the kingdom from him. It was already prophesied by God that that would happen. Samson had, or Samuel had anointed, anointed David, and Jonathan knew that as well. And Jonathan still, still, even though he would never get the kingdom, stayed loyal to his friend David. And even mentioned that I will serve with you when you are king. I will serve unto you when you are king. I will be by your side. Talk about a loyal friend right there. A loyal friend. A right friend loves you. Number two. Number two, the right friend speaks the truth to you. A right friend speaks the truth to you. If you've got, if you, really, do you want that friend that lies to you or do you want that friend that speaks truth to you? Think about it. So, uh, speaks the truth. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Proverbs 27, 6. Let me make sure I quoted that right. I like that verse. Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Someone that's willing to hurt your feelings to tell you the truth, that's the right kind of friend to have. That's the right kind of friend to have. I think of our preacher like that. He'll step on your toes all day long. You come to any service, whether it be Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday night, he's going to step on your toes at times. And that's a good thing right there. That's a good thing. A preacher that will just speak softly to you all the time because he's worried about you leaving with your tithe, that's a, that's a man to avoid right there. That's a man to avoid. I'm thankful for a pastor that speaks the truth to us. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What about Proverbs 27, 17? Again, familiar passages right here. But iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. 
Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. What kind of friends should I be looking for? Should I look for friends that are just going to tell me what I want to hear? Or should I look for friends that are going to make me a better person? Make me a better Christian, most importantly. Uh, bring me closer to God. And you know what, church? You look around you right here in this auditorium. These are, this is the best pool right here to find your friends, amen. This is the best fishing spot to fish for friends, amen. And uh, not your job, uh, even at, to an extent, not even your family. But the Bible talks about when Jesus said that, you know, you're going to have to hate your mother or hate your, your father or your brother or your sister. Because that's how contentious it is to be a Christian at times. And who are your friends? Who are your friends? Your friends will eat, make or break you. They'll either make you a better Christian or a worse one. And I think of this right here as well. Look, uh, let's see here. Go to 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. A true friend right here. A friend will speak truth to you. A friend will speak the truth to you. Friend will speak the truth to you. Second Samuel 11, and we, we, we've already checked out this, we've heard this passage over and over again, but David, remember, he, he uh, sleeps with another man's wife. After she gets pregnant, he goes and calls her husband, who is where David should be at, which is the battleground. He brings that man back. He tries to uh, get him to go to his house and be with his wife so he could cover up his sin. But the man was so honorable and so, uh, and, and so loyal to David that he refused to leave the king's house. In fact, he just slept outside the king's door. And uh, finally, David had enough, realized that this man wasn't going to serve his purpose. So he had the man, he had Uriah the Hittite deliver a letter to Job, the general of the army. He had a, a letter delivered to Job, the general of the army. And um, he had that man uh, deliver that letter, and it was for his death. It was for his death. And you look at this right here, look at chapter 12, look at chapter 12. So after David had committed this sin of, of sleeping with another man's wife, getting her pregnant, then killing her husband, you look at chapter 12, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David, Nathan being the prophet, the preacher of Israel. And he came unto him, unto David, and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had brought up and nourished up. Then it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was with him, was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that have done this thing shall surely die. You know, I love how backs, when backslidden people, you know, and I'm guilty of this as well, backslidden people can really get self-righteous real quick and be very quick to anger. And that's what happened here. David is, doesn't even realize that Nathan's preaching at him, but he's more than wanting to pass judgment on this, this example that was given to him. And he shall restore the lamb. Okay, verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of it Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the command of the Lord to do evil in his sight, that thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken thy, his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Anon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, because I will, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. That's a pretty powerful message that Nathan said to him right there. The king of Israel, the man that could have his head taken off with just a simple word. But here we go, right here, this man of God had no fear and he, was, he really was. He was a friend to David. David had messed up, 
And here Nathan calls out the sin and demands repentance from David. And church, we need to be looking for those kind of friends that see us when we are messed up, when we are backslidden, when we're out of church even, that they're the person that calls us, that texts us, that stops at our house. And it may put us under conviction. It may even bother us at the time. But you'll be thankful you have that kind of friend. You always will be. And we all need those kind of friends in this church right here. And let me ask you this right here. Are you that kind of friend? Now, you're not going and spying on them like I, I, I was watching through the binoculars of your house and I saw what you were watching on your TV the other night and that was just wrong. No, we we're not looking for those kind of friends, amen, all right? So uh, you're not going through their mail and seeing what they're, you know, receiving and stuff like that. Not that kind of friend. But we're looking for the, hey, we're looking for friends that will call out when we're, when we're astray. When we're, go, when, hey, when we're not doing right. When we're not where we should be at. What kind of friend are you and what kind of friends do you have? What kind of friend are you? What kind of friends do you have? A friend loveth at all times. Let me go back to the passage right here. Speaks the truth. All right, let's go over to this right here as well. Go to uh, Exodus 18. I like this Exodus 18 as well. You know, as we get older, especially men, and uh, we can get more and more prideful if we're not careful. No one's telling me what to do. You know what? No matter how old you are, you can always learn something. Amen? There's always something new to learn. Exodus 18. I was thinking of this saying. I was trying to recall it here, but I remember what it is. Every man is my teacher. Some what to do and some what not to do. Every man is my teacher. And uh, look at this right here, Proverbs, or I'm sorry, Exodus 18, Exodus 18. Now remember, think about this right here. Moses has already gone through a lot with the children of Israel. He's over 40 years old. We're not quite sure his exact age, but he's over 40 years old. He was a prince of Egypt. He led 2 million plus, 2 to 4 million at least, out of the land of Egypt. God has greatly used this man. If there's a man that has a reason to be a little bit prideful and feel a little special about himself... It's Moses. And God had just given him a great victory over the children of uh, Amalek, the Amalekites. And so he had a, a lot, to, you know, he was a very powerful man. The children of Israel uh, looked up to him, respected him. And uh, you see right here, when Jephro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, verse 1, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jephro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. And her two sons, of which the name was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And let's go over here. Let's go to, uh, look at verse 7. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came unto the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel. You know another good sign of a good friend is someone that's happy for you when God is blessing you. Not jealous, but happy for you. Hey, if you can't smile when someone, when your friend or your neighbor is doing well, there's something wrong with you. And that sounds like envy right there. Be excited when God is doing something great in somebody else's life around you. Because you'll want the same for you. When, when you go to rattle on their ear a little bit, how many got that? Some people are like, man, they're in a, they're, they're, God is blessing them and they won't stop talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. And you may feel like, man, they just won't shut up about this. But hey, be thankful for them because you may be the same person in a few weeks, amen, that God done. You want them to listen to you. So look at this right here. Someone, you know, a good friend is someone that when God is blessing you, they're rejoicing with you. Which the Lord hath done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 10. And Jephro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. And look at this verse 13. Look at verse 13. And it came to pass on the moral that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw that all he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to thy people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know in the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. 
Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it unto uh, thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be, Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And if you keep reading, basically what his father-in-law tells him to do is say, hey, stop dealing with all these issues. Divide it up among judges, judges over 50, judges over 100, judges over 1,000. Spread the workload out a bit. Jethro gave sound advice, and guess what? Moses listened, and he was helped because of it. Moses, like I said, was a powerful man, a great man, but he was willing to still take advice from someone else. And his father-in-law of all people, amen. It can be sometimes difficult. I'm thinking more of mother-in-law, but father-in-law as well, amen. No, I'm teasing. I love my mother-in-law. If she's listening to this, I love you, all right? You're great. But listen, we are never too old. We are never too old to take advice from someone. Even if it's, you know, I remember as a 22-year-old getting out of Bible college and coming here and preaching to people. Brother Joe, you've been, how long have you been in the ministry? How long have you been teaching Sunday school? Amen. Yeah, long time since dinosaurs were around. Yeah, I know, brother. No, I'm teasing. But listen, listen, brother Joe had to humble himself a little bit to listen to someone that's much younger than him, hasn't been teaching as long. But hey, guess what? Brother Joe allowed himself to be uh, taught and to be preached at by a man young, uh, much younger than him right there. And God will bless you for it. God will always bless you for taking advice, taking counsel. And guess what? If, if, if it's from God's word, then it's the best advice to take. Amen? Amen? And you look at this right here. So Jethro had advice for Moses, and he listened, and Moses was helped because of it. You're never too old to take advice from people, to take counsel. Hey, a good friend will speak the truth to you. They won't just scratch your ears or, you know, pet your head, make you feel good about yourself, and tell you how great you are. Um, let's, and, uh, um, let's, I think of another example as well, Paul with Peter. And uh, remember, Peter had some hypocrisy with the Jews. And uh, he uh, went and started, remember, the Jews were very secluded people, very uh, close-knit, uh, closed-off people. They didn't fellowship with Gentiles. They called the Gentiles dogs. And then God opened the door for the Gentiles to receive the gospel, which is us. Aren't you thankful for that right there, that God allowed us to be saved on our way to heaven? Glory, amen. Amen. And, uh, you know, we've had ran into uh, some Jewish people in the past, and they made some comments that, you know, referred us to it as dogs, amen? So they still got that same feeling. Um, but anyway, and there's nice ones out there too. Uh, but they, uh, Peter went and preached to the Gentiles, but then when he got back, he acted like he separated himself from the Gentiles, and it made Paul angry, and Paul called him out for his hypocrisy. And you always need friends that will call, call you out when you're doing wrong, when you're not doing right. Uh, So, number one, we have the right friend loves you. Number two, the right friend speaks the truth. Number three, the right friend forgives. The right friend forgives. Proverbs 17, 9. Go there. Proverbs 17, 9. Proverbs 17, 9 in your Bible. Proverbs 17, 9. I want to ask you this, too, especially to our... our, uh, couple or our our ladies uh, that have uh, spouses that are not in church right here too. Think about this right here. What kind of friend are you to your your spouse as well? And that's for our, 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 what kind of friend are you? It can be very easy just to stop talking to them about the gospel, stop talking about church, stop talking about what's right and family as well. But is that the right kind of friend? And it can, it can be very difficult. I know that, but don't ever stop speaking the truth to your lost loved ones, to the backslidden. Don't ever stop speaking the truth. They need it, and they need it often. Don't ever let don't let them forget. Amen. Even even if it uh, even if it starts to affect the relationship, don't ever stop speaking truth to them. They need it. They need it. Look at this right here. And I. Uh, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Be so very careful who you're walking with. And then going over to here. Let me go back here. Proverbs 17, 9. Look at this right here. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. So again, Proverbs 17, 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. We need to be someone that forgives others. We're all human. We're all sinners. And I think of the prodigal son. What was the father, wait, what was the father doing when, when he saw the prodigal son who had left him and wasted his money? As soon as he saw that son coming down the road, 
he ran to meet them. And we need to have that attitude of people as well. Uh, we need to have that attitude of forgiveness, that attitude of forgiveness. And lastly, point number four. So number one, the right friend loves you. Number two, the right friend speaks the truth. Number three, the right friend forgives. And number four, the right friend loves God. The right friend loves God. Who are your friends? 2 Corinthians 6.14, go there. 2 Corinthians 6.14. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord, what agreement, what fellowship hath Christ with Belial, Satan? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Look at verse 17 now. Wherefore, come out from among them, them being lost people, being those of the world, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will what, church? Receive Receive you. Be so very careful who your friends are. Your friends can make or break you. Your friends can make or break you. I'm thankful for our pastor. I try to always lift up the pastor when he's away. Because he goes through a lot. If you, don't, if you think you're number one target, what do you think the pastor of the church is? Because as the pastor gets taken down, the church a lot of times will go with it, unfortunately. Yeah. It will greatly hurt the church. Satan would love to take him down. He, he needs a, a wall of support around him. A wall of support. A, a wall of prayer around him. Aaron and Ur, let me ask you that. Are you pastors Aaron and Ur? When, when the devil is attacking, and you can kind of tell as well. You can really tell when pastor's under attack. And he may even mention it at times as well. Are you his Aaron? And you should be praying for him every day regardless. Because when, when, when pastor is, is right with God, walking with God, and close to God, hey, it's only going to pass over to us through the preaching and, and through, through what he gives to us from the pulpit. So we need to keep him in prayer all the time. What kind of friends are we to people around us? Let me ask you that first. What kind of friends are we to people around us? Let me say this right here. Your lost loved ones, if we never speak the truth to them, and I I say that to I have lost loved ones as well. Just because my close family is saved doesn't mean I don't have lost loved ones. And I speak to this. This is just to me as well. Are we the right kind of friend to our lost loved ones? The one that speaks truth to them. Because folks... We live one day and we die the next. I'm thankful for Miss Peggy accepting Jesus as her Savior, amen. Because we're not promised a day. But now, right. whatever happens to Miss Peggy, she's on her way to heaven now. Amen. And I'm thankful for that verse that says, nothing can pluck me out of my Father's hand. I'm thankful for that. Don't we want the same for our lost loved ones? Don't we want the same for our coworkers, for our friends? Are we speaking truth to them? And then for the fellow believers in here as well. We got to be so very careful that if someone ever tears another person down in this church, that we, that defenses come up quickly. And you may not even, you may not even really get along. Like you guys don't click. That person they're talking bad about, you may not even click with them that good. They may not be someone that you really talk to much, but they're still part of this church. They're part of our family here. We're part of the family of God here. And if someone attacks another member in this church in any way, even if it's subtle, our defenses should be up, and that should be brought to preacher's attention right away. And uh, we we have to be so very careful. The, The devil will send in wolves left and right to try to tear up the flock of God. And we've got to be on our guard, watching over one another, praying for one another, and lifting our pasture up as well. Let's keep each other up. Let's be the right kind of friend. Be the right kind of friend. And uh, I hope this helped you a little bit and, uh, and that, you know, that you thought about that and asked yourself that question, am I the right kind of friend? To the people in this church, to the lost loved ones, to the friends, and to the coworkers. And let's be so very careful about who we have as friends as well. Iron sharpeneth iron. Ask yourself that. Is my friends making me a better Christian? That's our number one priority. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. 
So really, what should my focus be? Should it be earthly minded or heavenly minded? Heavenly. Are people, are my friends making me better Christians? Are my friends making me a better Christian? Am I making people better? Or am I making my friends better Christians? Ask yourself that. When's the last time you texted someone on the phone, just texted them some scripture? When's the last time you texted uh, or called uh, one of your friends in the church and said, hey, let's pray together real quick? They may need it. You may need it. We always need it, amen? Let's help one another out. Bear each other's burdens. Bear each other's burdens. All right, I'm done. Love you all. I appreciate you. And it's good to be back in my church again. Yeah, it's good to see Brother T uh, Tracy and Miss Teresa back with, uh, here with us as well. Answered prayer right there. And excited to see what God's going to use them for here at the church. And uh, uh, Lord willing, Miss Teresa will... Uh, be able to figure out that organ over there. We'll see. We're no pressure here on that. Brother uh, Tracy going to be putting him all over the church as well. And I'm thankful uh, that fir first service I was back or second service I was back, he's like, you need me anywhere, you use me. And I appreciate that attitude right there. And that's the attitude we all need to have is, hey, guess what? This is our church, our church. And God wants to use you.